okay? And so you can see it's got a barbed tip and it's got a inch and three quarter hollow galvanized tube, right? And so what we do is at that barbed tip, we put a collet on there and it's like your air nailer that you'd use for wood construction, right? And we just put a, a, high, a pneumatic compressor on it, jack up the pressure and shoot it in the ground. But the collet at the tip actually pulls the bar in tension, whereas your air nailer has a, a little rod that pushes your nail into the wood in compression, right? So since the bar is in tension, we don't have to worry about it buckling. Um, and we can do a lot of things with that. Uh, so we'll just move on here. Here's a picture of what this device looks like. You can see the exhaust from the compressed air coming out of there. And what happened is that this uh, uh, equipment was used by the British in World War II to launch nerve gas at the Germans. And sometime in the 90s, the founders of our company found this land in a warehouse somewhere and said, hey, you know, we could treat this like a wood nailer and could we launch soil nails into the ground? And so they took and they did that. And uh, when that bar goes in the ground, it creates a friction bond with the soil, right? So unlike a traditional soil nail where you've got grout and soil bond, this is just a frictional bond between the soil. And the advantage to that is that you get immediate stabilization. The disadvantage is it's not very strong, but we can launch a lot of these very fast. So if you have a situation where it's sliding, or it's kind of creeping, or um, we'll show you this next one. Uh, could you play the video here, Chris? There's a video of it launching. So there you can see it going. It's like 200 miles, it shoots it in the ground. Um, but like, it, like this excavator here, um, if you're walking onto a spot that's unstable, you can start launching it in underneath you and build up stability as you progress from in that case, from, tor from away from us towards us, right? Um, and so it's kind of neat that way. Um, we can put holes in the front of it and use it for drainage and whatnot. Now they've done tests where they put stickers on the side of it and they've launched it in and excavated it. And the stickers are pretty much intact. And so what they surmise is that it creates a shock wave at the tip and it kind of peels the soil open and lets that tube follow in behind it. And then it collapses around the tube. Sounds cool. I believe it, I guess, um, <laughs> you know. Uh, since the tube doesn't have any connection to it, when we actually go to put our facing on, we'll grout a number six thread bar in there so that we have something to put a nut and a plate on, and we can do all of our soil mill facing at the front of that. So anyway, there's a there's the little description behind our logo. So it has nothing to do with the presentation tonight, but it, it's kind of cool, so I thought I'd uh, show it. Um, so here's the presentation. We're starting, and we're going to be talking about a project here in Elton, Illinois which is just north of St. Louis. It's just north of where the Missouri and the Mississippi River meet. At some time in like the early 1800s, Alton was a big kind of to-do town, a river town. And then St. Louis came on its own and Alton kind of fizzled out. Um, but where we're talking about is we're gonna be looking at this project right here in Riverview Park. And we're really gonna be looking right here at this bend. And I kind of wanted to just give you an overview of the site. Um, in this next picture, we're going to be kind of sitting right here and we're going to be looking at the house here. So here it is. We're right here. You can see there's a barricade up. This was that house at the end of the point. We're looking out on the Mississippi River. It's kind of a pretty view. Down here at the bottom is uh, Abbott Machine Company, right? And if you're one of these houses at the top here, you don't see the machine company, you just see the pretty view, right? Um, and since we're looking west, it gets a lot of wind coming up this up this slope. We tried to fly some drones and we've, we had about a 50% success rate because the winds just come up so bad. You can be at the back of the road here to off to our right and it's, it's calm, but as soon as you get out here, it's a lot of wind. So here we are looking back on the site and the last picture we were right about here, there was that house at the corner. Here's the Abbott machine. What you can see here is this limestone cliff coming around. Um, and you can see the landslide. Um, the limestone cliff back here at the landslide and around the whole area, you can see drill marks. So this was excavated limestone. That's probably why they create, how they created the area for Abbott Machine Company here. And downtown uh, Alton is over here. What's interesting about the geology, or the geology of the site or the topography, I guess I wanna say, 
is if you look at this house here, it's probably about 60 feet lower than the corner here. And behind these houses where all these trees are, there's like a bowl about 50 feet deep. This, like this house has a deck on it that the columns are at least 25 feet tall, right? So it drops really fast. And as it goes down here, it drops down here towards the downtown area pretty quick too. So we're at like a little berm here at this area. As we go to the left, elevation stays about kind of the same. So as a general overview of the site, um, okay, so we'll start with the timeline of the project. In 2019, there was heavy rains and in July, they noticed cracks. And so we'll start looking at the initial cracking. And what I want you to see in this first picture is I want you to see this little bit of cracking right here and a little bit of cracking here in the sidewalk. I mean, obviously you can see this crack's been patched and that crack's been patched in the past. Three weeks later, I feel like I'm a little too far away. Three weeks later, you can see the sidewalk crack here is opened and you can see this crack here is opened, right? And we're gonna go and we're gonna look at these same pictures just from a different angle. Here's that sidewalk crack. And then again, three weeks later, you can kind of see it's starting to move, right? So we know something's happening. Now, we'll take a moment here to do a safety moment here, right? So we've got this 100 year old concrete wall with a pretty bad railing. So, and you're on the other side of the tension crack, maybe, maybe, I mean, I've done things like this, right? Who cares, right? But so if you've been watching any TV this fall, you know, I'm about 12 slides in here. This is about the time where we need to get the audience reaction, right? And so let's see what our fan says. Uh-oh, trouble, right? And so Taylor's worried, right? And if, I know. <laughs> so if Taylor's worried, the city's worried, right? So the city closes the road, right? And so here we are one more week after the last picture, and you can see they've closed the road, and you see those cracks are growing. Here's that one that we looked in the concrete. Now, there's a few things that I want to show you in this picture. Right here, I want you to look at that joint right there. You see the exposed joint? We're going to talk about that a couple times. Um, when the failure happens, that panel remains, and it cantilevers over the void. Right here, you can see this old black wall. That's old wall. This is less old wall. And right here is where the failure happens, right? So we'll give you kind of an overview of what goes away. Uh, I think this barrier ends up down in the hole, and a few of these end up down in the hole. So just to orient where you're doing. So we had closed the roads last week. And so what do you do next? You drill some borings, right? And uh, so we'll take a picture of the borings. And so we got boring one and boring three here. Uh, just to give you an orientation, boring three eventually gets an inclinometer in it, right? So that's kind of why I wanted to show you this picture. You can see there's a little barricade there. They've closed off the road, but they haven't closed off access to the public, right? And here is that spot where the old meets the older wall, right? So you can kind of get a view for what it is. Um, it's a beautiful park. There's like a little, it, it, you can see it extends out to the right. So if you're out, here on the park, you get a view up the up the river and down the river. And on a sunny, non-windy day, it's a beautiful place to hang out. So they, the times that I was there, there was quite a few people in the park to, for just being a residential park with not much going on. Anyway, we'll talk about Boring 3 um, in Klinometer a little bit later. So this is our final cross section. And I just thought I'd throw that up. You can see the line here that shows the failure slope to it. You can see all the soil properties, and if you want to look at that, go ahead. Uh, generally, it's like a fat clay, a lean clay, a fat clay over a lean clay, and a bunch of silt, and then a fat clay, and then rock. And we got like 80 feet to rock, and it shows 41 feet in the in the uh, model here of a of the limestone cliff face. You know, maybe it was 60 feet. I don't know. Right? It doesn't matter at that point in my model. Um, what I'm going to tell you is that every time I'm going to show you one of these models, all these soil properties are going to be different, right? So every time we did the analysis, somebody else did it. Somebody else has looked at the, the soil borings differently. Or in our next model, I don't even know if we had soil borings at the time. You know, so this is eventually what we ended up with. So as you're looking at this, and I show other models, this is the one that we settled on. Um, you can see we did a different layer here at the front. Um, 
And what we did, and I didn't put those properties in there, it doesn't matter. But what we did is we tried to account for some different variations in moisture of the surface, right? So we just did another layer, did different properties of that. Um, and all this silt that you see here was, was uh, noted in the boring as LUS. So think about that as you see some of these pictures of the cliff. Um, they're claiming that this is LUS, and, and maybe it is, maybe it's not, but it's still holding up pretty good. By the time this fails, it's like a 53 degree angle. So I, I don't know. It is what it is. But so there you go. So that was growing the SPTs. We come out, you know, two, two weeks later, three weeks later, and give a proposal to fix the wall in 15 days for $350,000, right? So that's what we tell the city, hey, we can fix this right now. And let's look at what our proposal is. So here's the, our model for the proposal. Like I said, soil layers are different. Different guy did it, whatever. Um, but what we're going to do is we had the cracking. So you can see where we are assuming the failure point. And the wall on the outside face was really only six feet tall. So we we're going to dig it down to about 15 feet reach over the shoulder like we saw in the soil nails shooting below with the logo, right? Awesome. Um, and just put a bunch of soil nails in, right? And so that was what we were gonna do. We sent that to the city and uh, they didn't do anything with it, right? Uh, they said, thank you, thank, thank, thanks for letting us know. And uh, so in December, we get our first inclinometer reading and I, I don't know anything about this. I don't know why it took from, from August to December to get an inclinometer reading, but that's the first one that I know of. And then in January, it fails. So January of 2020, it fails. And let's look at what we were gonna propose, right? So we are gonna do 15 feet with this wall that I just explained. And here's that failure geometry that I showed you before. And you know this was six feet, and I just threw the 13 feet on there just so we could kind of have a visual reference. And then what I did is I put, I kind of sketched in these yellow lines to show where our 15 feet wall would have been. So it looks like we're pretty close, right? I mean, you can kind of see failure zone there, kind of a failure zone there. Maybe our nails would have worked, right? Maybe we would have stabilized it. We don't know, we'll never know. So here's the failure. Uh, and this looks like it's a, a month or so afterwards. You can still see snow on the ground. I mean, it is St. Louis, so it's not very cold, right? Um, but some things to look at. I'm sure the first thing you see is this manhole, right? That looks very suspect, right? Uh, we talked to the city about this, and apparently in the 80s and 90s, they took surface water and dumped it over the, over, over the edge. And they said in the 90s, they shut that off. Okay, now I'm going to show you a few pictures when we're done, and we're going to see some seepage in this corner. I don't know. Um, so, okay, so maybe that's doing it, maybe not. Um, you can see there's a sheet pile wall down here, um, and when we see in the failed stuff, there's like three more sheet piles that went with it. Um, so at some point they put sheet piles in, and this happens to be right at the end, enough that the failure took three of them with them. So, well, maybe the sheet piles were good enough. Maybe they should have just kept going with the sheet piles. This right here is a dead man. There's a dead man there and a dead man on the other side of this curve. And you can kind of see that's a cable coming out of the dead man that broke. I don't know if that's original or if they did that after the fact, um, but there was dead men there. Um, and this piece is that piece that I pointed out earlier that's cantilevered out. And the next couple of slides, we'll see a view from that from the other angle. You can see that hanging out there, and it's kind of a fun little picture. So what does Taylor think about this? Let's go crashing down, right? And do you like the, the reference there? It's just so you know, it's Taylor's version. Okay, so moving on. Not only is Taylor concerned, but so are the people of Abbott Machine, right? Because they're down here and stuff's falling at them. So nothing hit their building, but what they did do is they took some of those concrete panels and they put them up against the building wall. They picked them up, moved them against the building wall in case something else comes down. And so here you can see one of those panels, uh, here uh, down at the bottom at uh, Abbott Machine. You can't quite see it here in this picture, it gets cut off on the top of the screen, um, but they also had a burn here. 
and the guy's about to climb the berm. And I assume the berm was built after the fact from all the water that they were dumping off. That Abbott machine's like, we got to keep this water from going to our building. They built this berm, and they're lucky they did because a lot of stuff got hung up on the berm, like this chunk of concrete here. Here's the wall panel that I was talking about before that was cantilevering out. Kind of fun, right? Uh, fortunately for me and for Abbott Machine, you couldn't re readily access that panel because it was hanging, you know, like when your kid is like seven and they got a tooth that's hanging there and they don't want to get pulled out and it's like flapping back and forth, right? And it, up at the top, it just feels like you just want to go boom to that panel, right? Because it's just going to go down. Uh, but fortunately, it was an easy to access, so it just had to hang out there as long as it could. Eventually, we took it off with a backhoe, so we didn't let it go down the hill. Uh, you can see the cantilever of the road. You can see a little bit of the uh, dead man there, and it gives a view of the vertical cliff of the limestone. Okay, moving on. So what do we do next? Next, we fly our drones. Like I said, you wait until the wind's down enough that we can fly our drones. And the drones provide our geometry because they've got LiDAR imaging. So that failure plan that I showed before was from our drones. We can cut a section in where we want, uh, take the data, import it into our stability model, and just run as many stability models as we want. They also provide us cool pictures, right? So, I mean, that's really the fun part of it, right? And from this picture, of course, you can see the guy flying the drone. Uh, you can see those sheet piles that I was talking about. Here's the barrier that's in the... In the landslide, there's that panel that I wanted to push down. Uh, you can see the dead man sticking right through there. So I'm just going to take on this next picture and run you down uh, the, the drone again. And you can see the sheet piles hanging out here at the bottom and the other concrete block and stuff. And you can see kind of how far they, they flew off. And here's that berm right at the bottom of the screen. So fortunately, the berm was there. Uh, the time that I was on site, this was really swampy over here. So interesting to note. Okay, so we do, we got our geometry, we run some models, we decide, okay, let's give them another proposal, right? So here's our stability model for our fix. And what we are going to do is we're going to do a soil nail wall down 40 feet to a micropile cap and, you know, put in micropiles. And the purpose of the micropiles is to hold this cellular concrete uh, and precast wall panel facing that was going to build back the road, right? Because the roadway comes out over to here or something like that, right? We've lost about 18 feet of the width of the roadway that they'd want us to build back. And then down on the slope, we're going to put in pin and mesh, as we call it. And that's just a, another soil nail. It's a surface reinforcement. The mesh is really high tensile rock fall mesh, right? Um, so we're just going to put those in. And so that was our original plan. And again, like I said, all the colors are different. All the soil properties are different, whatever. Um, so we come in and we do that. And we propose 4.6 million and 130 days, right? So this is like nine months later, nine months later. And God, you know, if the city had bought the 350,000, they would have saved a lot of money. And I wouldn't be here presenting to you guys, right? <laughs> Right? So then this would be just a normal project. We do this every day. Um, but, you know, you kind of see why the city doesn't have 350000 laying around, right? They got to raise taxes to get th those sorts of money or whatever. So the city looks at that and says, okay, yeah, we got to get FEMA funds. And so they get FEMA funds and the city has to pay $1.25 million for the FEMA funds, right? And it takes them um, two years before they release the RFQ. Right. And, you know, I'm sure in that time, they I don't know what they did. Right. They they raised taxes. They had to go through the process of getting FEMA funds. And now this is I, I also point that out because everything up to here, I was not involved. This is where I come in. Right. So if you want to complain about anything that you saw back before then, like the model is wrong or, you know, and that's why I don't know about the inclinometer. Right. Because I wasn't involved. Right. So so I come in here. And so this is the RFQ. And what's interesting is they kind of took our advice on the last proposal. They show like a 35 foot high something, and they show you building back something. They call out removing the failed mass. They tell you to protect the slope, right? And so they kind of took our idea and, and ran with it. 
which is good. Um, so Keller and I, Keller and us, Keller and GSI get shortlisted. And, you know, so now we got to give them a price. And so the fun thing is then what would Keller do, right? So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what would Keller do. And we kept thinking Keller is going to do something big, right? They got all the big toys, soldier piles, sea cans, tie backs, whatever they're going to do. And, and watch this animation. Look how slow this is, right? <laughs> I did this intentionally because whatever Keller was going to do was going to be slow and big, right? It's still going, right? They, they'd still be going. Whatever we're going to do is light and fast, right? That's really what we were thinking, right? We're going we're gonna to hang people off of ropes, right? They're going to come in there. If they're going to put in something big down here, they're going to have to build a ramp, right? And to do that, they're going to have to block off this road. And, you know, we were worried about this lady's bushes, right? Not even blocking off a road. We were worried about the bushes um, because we spent a lot of time. Are we going to take out the bushes? Are we going to keep the bushes? Anyway, um, at the end of the day, I think we kept the bushes, so just so you know. Um, but, you know, big toys, right? They've got all the big toys. If you got big toys, you use big toys, right? So anyway, we actually, you know, obviously we won the bid, right? Um, and otherwise I wouldn't be here talking. Um, but I ended up with $4.3 million in 96 days. So we also knew that the city uh, with their FEMA request got like $5 million, right? So we kind of knew... We got to be below that. And fortunately, we were starting from 4.6 million. So how did we save $300,000 in 34 days, right? That's that's the question. And I'm going to take full credit for that um, <laughs> because I'm here talking and nobody can argue with me. Um, so what, what we did is we looked at that old model where we had the, the cellular concrete, right? And the reason we were looking at cellular concrete is because it's lightweight. And we didn't want to put a lot of surcharge on there, but we had a micropile system and a micropile cap. And I said, well, if we got micropiles there, let's make the micropiles do the work, right? And we do GCS walls all the time. We don't have a clue what we're doing with this precast wall panel, how we're going to pour the cellular fill, how we're going to form it, how we're going to connect it to the precast panel. We didn't know. So we had just money in there to figure that out. And I said, we do this all the time. Our guys know how to do it. Let's do that. So the difference is our GCS wall fill uses 57 stone. What's that? 110 pounds of cubic foot. And the, full, the cellular uh, concrete is like 30 to 40, right? So we're adding a lot more weight here, but we're supporting it with the micropiles. So we designed the micropiles to carry all that load in the overburdened soils. So we're not even counting on the rock. If we hit rock, bonus. Okay. And so that was the major thing. We still have the soil mail wall doing the permanent lateral restraint, and we still have this pin and mesh system down here, right? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about GCS walls as we go in. And so um, there's two main documents, right? They're both FHWA documents. This bottom one, the construction guidelines for geosynthetic reinforced abutments and integrated bridge systems, GRSIBS. You've probably seen that manual. So we call it geosynthetically confined, all the FHWA stuff likes reinforced, right? Okay, it's the same thing. And like I said, same as GRS. And the I, I, I think of it as an MSE wall on steroids, right? Um, our internal people might get mad at that, but I'll explain that a little bit more here coming up. Um, but you can see what it is, is we, with a GRS or GCS, the minimum spacing of your grid is 12 inches. And most of the time, what we're doing is seven and five eighths because we're using uh, a regular CMU block, which is seven and five eighths inches tall. And that narrow spacing of your grid and reuse fabric um, prevents your soil from dilating and doesn't allow it to go into lateral loads, right? So where an MSE wall, you've got internal stability failures that you've got to look at, like slippage of the block, uh, load at the facing kind of thing. In a, in a GRS wall, you don't have those because your grid's too tight to allow it to really happen. And this picture here is one from uh, some research they did where they did a negative batter on a GRS wall. And you can see there that they, they must have built this with a form. I don't know much about it, um, but you can see them obviously dumping on uh, all the load on the negative batter there. 
uh, you can see how kind of how from the scale how big that is. I wanted to point that out because Barrett and Buckman are the founders of GSI. They're the guys that took that that gas launcher, turned it into a soil nail launcher, and started GSI, which started as soil nail launcher company. Um, but so they were pretty heavily involved in the in the development of the GCS or GRS walls. And I'm going to go on and talk about the facing. Here's another one that they did with a negative batter for a bridge in Colorado. But the question that we get most of the time, and I got this question on this job, is how does the block not slide out? And so I just wanted to highlight this. Uh, other facing elements are possible because the facing is not considered a structural component. Its contribution to the strength is not accounted for in internal stability design. The primary purpose for it is a form for compaction, serve as a facade, protect against loss of the granular fill from weathering. It's not considered a structural element. Then it's up to the user to decide what, what they want to do with it, right? And so most of the time they say like, like we do use a, a CMU block or we use segmental retaining wall blocks, right? You can use the same thing. It's just that you're putting that grid in really tight. It gives you that conglomerate mass, right? Okay. So back to uh, our cool picture of the drone, right? Just to kind of give you a before picture, and now we're going to give you an after picture. So this is this is the final design. This is what we finally built. I want to give you kind of this idea so you can look at it as we go through the pieces, right? So um, obviously, what you see right here is the concrete from the micropile cap. Here's that seepage that I was talking about, which is directly right below that uh, manhole. Um, we got a, some soil nail wall exposed on both the left and the right. Here you can see the, the concrete masonry units. Uh, you can see the top surface is just that 57 stone. The city was going to come in under a different contract to repave the road, put in a moment slab, put in a, a wall and a fence there. So that's why this is still all barricaded. Obviously, it's nice to keep the uh, public out of there. Uh, what you see on the, on the bottom on the left is that pin and mesh system. And you've noticed that the there's like a dimple at each one of these spots. Um, that's what you want to do is you want to uh, create a dimple so that you can shove that nail head, that spike plate that they call it. You can see it's like a diamond shape and it's got a few little tongs on it to grab the mesh. You want to shove that back into the ground like we're showing so that it kind of predeforms the shape, right? Um, because it's just a tension element. And so it's got to deform to get into tension. So you want to create that pre-deformation. Um, and then the green stuff is a turf reinforcement mat, which really grabs the soil and kind of acts as a bridge, allows the uh, vegetation to go through, but it acts as a bridge between the soil and the mesh, right? So it just doesn't slough out the mesh there. Okay, so we'll look through all the pieces. And so we started... Uh, they said there was a water line there that was back by the bushes, right? And uh, so we started potholing for it, and it's right in the middle of the road. So day one, we had to redesign. And uh, we had a, a original as a straight slope here at a half to one, so pretty flat slope. And here you can see the water lines. And so since we had gotten a long reach excavator, uh, the, the width of the tracks were wider than what we had anticipated. So the so the guy's like, well, if you could go vertical for the top five feet, we can fit our, our, our machine in here without having to go onto the bushes. Perfect. <laughs> and since we had the water line in the way, we were able to do that. And we had to really steeply dip this top nail. And we had to kind of dip the next nail a little bit steeper than we wanted. And we offset that top nail so that it didn't hit any of the others, right? So we had a rectangular grid on that. Uh, you can see our micropile cap there and, and the block going up. So take a look at that geometry, and then we're going to see, I think, on the next picture, how we actually build it. Yeah, do you see the five-foot vertical? Nah, not really, right? So we just kind of went, well, we're, he said five-foot vertical, and we got to get down to that point. Let's just change the slope, which works fine. Um, but here you can see our long-reach excavator, and you can see kind of how close we are to uh, the edge of the construction, right? Uh, where we had those uh, dead men there, we just incorporated them in the wall, just bent the wall around it. Um, and you can see the long reach drill in the micropiles. These are hollow bar micropiles, we, or hollow bar soil nails. We also used hollow bar micropiles um, on the whole job. 
Okay. So we had the inclinometer in D3, like I showed you before. And the city had a good geotech engineer. They were they were quite good. And uh, one day they called and we're putting in maybe our third or fourth lift in nails. And he says, hey, uh, we got a quarter inch of movement at about 16 feet there. Uh, we went out and looked at the site. We're not seeing any cracking. And we think you put a nail like six inches away from the inclinometer. <laughs> and sure enough, yeah, we looked into it and like, yeah, that's what happened. So all the I mean, this is this is the one that isolates the isolates it the best. I've got a lot more inclinometer readings. Um, this inclinometer number went in two years ago, right from when we started, and the whole time it's this shape. Everything below, except for that, that's the only difference in the whole thing. So, which is pretty good. Uh, getting back to the design overall, we're trying to, you know, this is like, well, can you get a 1.5 factor of safety? And we're like, no, we can get you a 1.3, um, but we really think it's more of a, you know, not a deep-seated failure. Deep-seated failures, we're not changing that. I mean, we're not that, you know, we're not impacting that. So they agreed to that too. So here we are uh, drilling the micropiles for the micropile cap. And we're also drilling the pin and mesh. And like I said, light and small, right? So we're hanging guys off a of rappel. There's our wagon drill off a of rappel. And you can see this guy is drumaring back up the slope, right? And like I said, it's like a 53 degree slope. And these guys are pretty fit. Um, because I watched this guy, I took this picture um, and I'll have you look at that ladder there in a second. Uh, I watched this guy, you know, drumar up the rope. And he gets to the top and he puts on, he clips on something that he picked up, the drill or something, and he repels back down and he looks at his drill and he jumars back up. <laughs> uh, and this was January and, you know, uh, and I was cold because it, it was windy. And so these guys are out there all day. You see this guy, he's got something, looks like he's playing with his belt. He's got a remote control for this, this drill. So there's a guy in the long reach, and all of our guys have a, a, a headset that's connected to them, and it works as uh, ear protection and also communications. And so there's four of them, and if you're on the headset, you're part of the in-crowd, right? Because you get to know what, everything that's going on, and it's cool, and you get to talk to everybody. But if you're not in the headset, it's like you shouldn't even be there, right? Okay. And there's been one time that I've been on the headset, and it was awesome, right? <laughs> and another time, like this time, I'm like, I don't know. And, but so this guy here can talk to like the guy in the rig real easily, right? And he just tells him left, right, up, down, tilt. And as soon as he gets in the right spot, the guy in the rig just puts up his feet and he's got like five or 10 minutes or whatever, uh, 15 minutes to sit there while this guy runs the drill rig, right? Or runs the drill itself. So it was a pretty slick system that way. Um, back to the ladder. Well, actually, I think I'll show you the drill next. So here's a close up of the drill. Uh, you can see how it's just got an eye hole here. It's got some drill, uh, some D rings there, so they can shift it left and right. Uh, this is the mast; it folds back up. You know, you can see the wench and the the bits there. I thought you guys might find that interesting. Uh, we can drill about twenty feet with that drill rig, um, and a lot of times you have to use these D rings to anchor it off to get you know your resistance to the crowd pressure, right? Um, and I think it's only a four inch hole that we drill with it. So there's that. Um, so here's that ladder again. So, uh, like I said, when I was there and we didn't have the rebar down there, I was coming to check the rebar and it wasn't there. And I figured, you know, I don't need to go down that ladder. I'm good enough up here. Um, so we'll zoom down. So, like I said, we had everybody climbing down the hall, uh, repelling and stuff, and we were going light and fast, like I said. Um, so we have this plan. We're going to take our bottom nail and we're going to attach a uh, eye bolt to the nail, and we're going to run a cable through our micropile cap out to another eye bolt. That eye bolt then could be used to hold the high tensile mesh, and it could be used for the repelling anchorage, right? And we'd have one every ten or five feet. I can't remember what our spacing was, and we thought, oh, this is cool, right? We're solving two problems at once. This works great. And so again, when I was out there. 
uh, what I saw is they took that eye bolt and put it on one of our railing posts to hold a, uh, a hose. There you go. So, you know, sometimes the best laid plans. And then what they did down, down at the bottom is they put in more hollow bars and just anchored off to those. I don't know. I don't do this every day, right? So I'm not guy repelling down for work, but I would have really liked that cable. That was kind of a great idea, I thought. So the other thing, as I mentioned, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the mesh. You can kind of see it here. Um, the thing I, I told the guys in the field a couple times, and the reason I took the picture of the ladder from above is I was there to make sure that these plates were at the right spot. So we've got a 14 inch slab and we got punching shear of the plates and whatnot. And I wanted them four inches from the bottom. And I told the guy four inches from the bottom. And the next time I talked to him, I said four inches from the bottom. He said, yeah, 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 we'll do it, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll do it, right? Okay, so I went out there the week before this and they weren't doing it yet. And this picture was taken by another engineer of ours who was actually going to the site to do proof testing. And he thought I lived close. Well, this guy is from Florida. So, I mean, I am close to him, but not close to the site. And he's like, hey, you want to meet me out there? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm like nine hours away. And he's like, oh, but I told him, look for the plates, look for the plates. And so fortunately, we had some uh, iterations on that. And I'm like, yeah, because you can see there's the Adobe, the chair, and you can see this is like at the top. So that's like 10 inches from the bottom, right? So fortunately, we caught it. We were able to lower the plates to the right spot and everything was fine. You just never know what's going to happen, right? Um, as far as the mesh, the mesh is high tensile, like we said. It's what you'd see if you're driving in Colorado and you see the, the mesh hanging off the slopes of the rock. It's rockfall mesh. It's 256 KSI, but it's thin. So you get about 1.3 kips per wire and that spike, spike grabs four or five wires. So you get a lot of capacity out of it, right? Um, you know, it looks like fencing to me. I don't know enough about it. So here we are at the bottom. Uh, here's the micropile cap. You can see we've captured all the drainage and we're gonna put it in those uh, drain tiles and run them down the slope. Uh, here we are setting our first row of uh, GRS wall. So we've got the blocks in place. The first, the first one just sits right on the cap. We just fill it with 57 stone. And here you can see the next layer of uh, grid or mesh. We use a mesh. It's not very strong either. You don't need a lot of strength out of things. Something like 300, 400 pounds of linear foot that we're using, not a lot. Um, you can see the guy's still drilling on rappel. They're still just using the uh, hollow bars that they stuck in the ground. Um, and as we go up, um, you can just see all the mesh coverage. Um, here we are. This is how we placed the 57 stone. We just used the bucket and lowered it down. Pretty slow. but fast and light compared to Keller. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the solid bars that we used, you can see them laying here. We, they were epoxy coated uh, down for the pin and mesh system. As we got up higher, we had the uh, remote controlled compactor so that our guys didn't have to keep putting on their harness to get close. You know, They'd have their harnesses to lay out the grid and then, then back up and then they could do the compaction. Um, so that's how we took care of that. Um, so I call this shotcrete robot, and we do actually have something called that we call the shotcrete robot that we use, and it actually has, you know, you can control the, the nozzle and stuff. But here what we really did is we just duct tape a, whole, a nozzle to the, to the stick, right? And I'm going to go back on, uh, you can kind of see it here. This is all exposed face that we were able to put nails through because we had the long reach. It went with the rest of the, the rest of the landslide, but we didn't really have a plan to do much else with it. We did put nails in it and we did shot create it just to protect it in the long term. You can kind of see here more nails sticking up. Those are the hollow bars that the guys used for repelling when they actually hung the mesh and stuff. I guess they just love doing that. Um, but yeah, so the shotcrete robot. So it's really just a dude running the stick. So how did we do? This is the final final design that I showed you before. Uh, you know, so you can see some of the pieces. The other thing, I don't know if you can see it here. Um, I'll show you here on this picture. Is at the edges here, we actually bring the shotcrete over onto the GRS wall facing 
just to give it a barrier for erosion so it doesn't erode right at that contact. Um, so that's one of the things that we do. So what's our fan think? All the pieces fell right into place. That's, I don't think she's been that happy ever before, except for today, which is her birthday. <laughs> right, right? She's got two reasons to be happy today. And of course, one, one more bad thing, the wall is not our problem anymore, right? Any other? Okay, so that's all I got. Oh, I do have some plugs here. Uh, so Kyle gave the plug for the Geotech Conference. Obviously, submit to that. Um, also, if you want, the S3 conference is in Denver this year. We were in Boston last year. In Boston last year, we had four Minnesota people present. Well, actually, it's two teams. It was Nate Iverson and Chuck Hubbard, and then Augusta Lucarelli and, and Brent Tiro. Thank you. Um, and both presentations are awesome, right? Um, and the beauty, beautiful part about it is all you got to do is submit a 300 word abstract, tell us what your project, why your project's cool, why we should listen to it. And you don't have to write a paper, just show up and give us a 20 minute presentation, right? Um, and, but if you want to write a paper, the DFI magazine is looking, is doing a special issue on excavations and slopes. Uh, the issue is like the June issue, but the, the paper is due in April. Get a hold of me if you want to write a paper on about a project, and maybe we can get you as one of the ones doing the DFI magazine. Uh, so that's it. That's all I got. Uh, thank you. Any questions? I'm, I'm not. I'm not taking questions on Taylor Swift. I don't have a real depth, in depth knowledge of that. Yeah, go for it. Great presentation, Jeff. Uh, I was curious about like some of the temporary conditions that the workers are exposed to, but is in the final condition. Like, what is GSI typically doing to study those temporary conditions? Yeah. So, for example, like as the soil nail goes down, you know, you do the interim steps, right, um, for each soil nail lift. Um, in this case, the question that is is the best one for you to ask is what about that bench right when we were drilling the micropiles we had the soil nail wall there and we had the bench in place and other than just looking at it and saying we came back this far from the ferry plane and we've unloaded those soils we didn't do any other analysis at that at that step maybe we should have but that that's a good question right so right now i'm working on a project where we do have a lot of temporary condition cases that we are going through, and it's kind of a pain, right? I mean, you got to do it, but it's and it's not just the individual stages of the soil nail. Um, it's like we're gonna build here so that we can get our equipment down, and then you know, can we? How much can we load this? You know, the typical that you're just trying to be like a doctor No. No, um, generally, so generally, it's a, what's fun is a lot of times we don't have soil information. Um, uh, a, a lot of our bread and butter work is slough side to side of a roadside, a road or something like that. And we'll come out, and the other thing we do is we do a lot of emergency repairs. And in that situation, we'll come out, we'll do a back analysis, get our soil properties from that, and then design it going forward. This one, we have good soil information. Um, generally, we're in that 1.3 to 1.5 range, one of those two, for a factor of safety. Of course, our back analysis, we're looking at a factor of safety of one, right, or close to it, right? So the one that I'm banging my head against right now is uh, in California, seismic, 1.1 for seismic stability, which uh, is a local city ordinance where the rest of California just does 1.0 for seismic stability. Uh, this town that I'm in does 1.1, and I'm impressed by the difference between 1.0 and 1.1. It's That 1.1 is a big difference. And then 1.5 for static stability, which by the time you figure out uh, 1.1 on seismic, the static just comes along for the ride. You know, it was just, I'm banging my head on that. It's just that 10% more is quite a bit. It's impressive.
Yeah. Just a comment. Um, it seemed to me that that initial bid of 300,000 K it's probably fortunate maybe that the city rejected that for GSI. Well, yeah, for us, definitely, right? Yeah. <laughs> Right? I mean, we do, we do projects like that all the time, right? That are just small and when we love it, right? In and out and done, right? Maybe the lesson learned is always make those nails a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Sweet so talking into finding some money or something. I don't know. But you know, I mean, like I said, it's a city, they're slow hole and not easy to move that fast. But anyway. Yeah, was there a vibration down the rest of the block around this slope, why it's brighter than it's still? No. <laughs> yes. Right? Do you like that? Uh, <laughs> because if you go over this way, you know, it doesn't look so good. Yeah. And you go over this way and it gets steeper. So, yeah. No. Were any other cracks seen in the road, or was it just that? The, the road looks really, really quite good. And also, you don't really quite see it here, but the road dips down a little bit. It loses some elevation. Not a lot, but but some, you know. I think the water, you know, had to have been a big deal, right? And also, the road coming back here, the high point of that road is right about here. So it could get surface water coming this way on it, right? Right. I think they were uh, 38 or 40 feet, something like that. Um, I think it shows 38 for the lower ones. Yeah, I think they're all maybe 38 feet. So we'd like to do the 38 feet because then it gives us two, two feet for the connection at the front, right? It's kind of silly, but because they're 10 foot sticks, so. I only eight feet on the technomatic bottom for the for the slope superficial superficial. Oh, eight feet. So actually, good question. Um, we did the top two nails as twenty feet, and then the rest of them is eight feet. Why we looked at surface stability through there, and that's kind of what we came up with, right? Um, obviously, the twenty feet, as I said, is the limit we could do with the rig. Um, the eight feet showed the stability, but it was kind of one of those deals like, well, we know uh, surface water, even though we've got all the drainage there, we know surface water, like rain is going to hit this and come and hit and land on this slope, right? So we, we just kind of wanted longer nails for these top two rows, just because we had no good reason for it, right? <clears throat> anyway, anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you used the term, uh, I think, dead man a couple times. Yeah. Well, what is that? It's just a block of concrete bedded, embedded in the soil that they hook a connection element to and hook it back up to your retaining wall, right? So just a passive restraint system. Is that part of an original construction, constructability type wall, just to build their road? I don't know. We couldn't figure it out. It looks like it was old enough that what is that the uh, the cable on the dead man had corroded, so it it could have been who knows how old, right? With salts and whatnot going through there. Um, I kind of I kind of think it was original because that wall didn't look any newer, and it had to have been connecting to the wall. Um, with like the surface mark going down on top of that slope, um, like what was the depth of like any of the seepage space or anything like that? Is that part of the study? No, no. Um, and uh, like I said, the only water that I've seen there, and, and when we were working, we didn't experience any moisture coming through, any water, or any seepage. Uh, you just see it on that last picture where it's in that corner there. So I don't know if that's just surface water or something sitting there or not. Yeah. Did you see seepage come out of the silts at all? No, we didn't see anything as we were drilling. It was dry. It was good. Yeah. I'm kind of wondering, um, can we know why the silt failed uh, to begin with? Uh -uh. Is it anything to do with? Could it have anything to do with the, the amount of silt I saw the from the well, the boring log? Um, there was there was fat clay, there was some clean clay, and then 
Wow, a ton of silt. Does that have anything to do with that? In Moscow, but, I, but I, I think it had to have been a water-driven thing, all right? It started because of a heavy rain event, and then I, I think it just probably didn't get rid of the water very fast, being the silts and the clays. And then when we got to January with the snow events and in St. Louis there, it, you know, freezes and thaws and melts and stuff like that. So I, I think it was something like that, a surface water phenomenon that kind of drove it. Because the bedrock wasn't found until at depth, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah 80 feet to bedrock, right? Yeah, so, so it wasn't like a crack in the limestone. No, no. Okay. Yeah, right. So I, I know you had said earlier you wanted to protect the water lines over there, so that was kind of a good I guess, but how much cleaning out, I guess you could say, was part of your... Well, what really what really controlled it? So you can see we kind of have that existing grade line here, right? So you can kind of see where the failure happened. What really controlled it was this bench distance that we wanted right here. You know, we wanted to, we just randomly picked we wanted about four to five feet sticking out there, right? Um, we didn't want to go right to the edge. We wanted to have something there so that if it does, we we're going to try and protect it, which you saw with the, the turf reinforcement mat and whatnot. But uh, we wanted to give that something to kind of protect erosion from that face, right? So that we had some time if that starts to go away, right? Of course, we've got the micropile cap and the micropiles, but they still need the soil for stability, you know, for bracing. Um, so that was that was when we really set that th right there. As far as you know, you can see that these these soils to the left of that really haven't failed. Um, part of the thing too is uh, development length of that uh, GRS wall. It's not very long, right? But we didn't want to go very narrow here, right? I mean, could we have taken off a, a row of micropiles? Maybe, you know. Maybe we did use the micropiles in some of the global stability, right? So that's why you can see they're battered here. We battered them at 10 degrees. Does it help? Maybe a little bit. Um, we did use it in the stability model. It doesn't help much for, for the overall global stability. Uh, not as much as the nails do, do right? You're getting, you're getting more bang for your buck out of the nails than you are out of the micropiles. But we did include all that in there. <clears throat> 